this is actually quite, um, how shall I say, a hot topic in biosciences because, as you all know, we now have technology that allows us to gather a huge amounts of data. So, for example, the human genome has been sequenced several times and, uh, of course, uh, there is a lot of information there. Uh, more and more species are sequenced and there's a huge amount of data here. So we need to come up with some creative ideas, excuse me, how we can actually visualize these data and visualize data in a statistical context as well. That's usually very important. Now in the last lecture, we spoke about the measures of central tendency. And I told you there are usually, well, what people consider the most important ones. These are the mean, the median, and up to a certain point also the mode. The mean is just simply the average. The median is when we group things, things have them in ascending or descending order, and... Uh, pick out the middle, and the mode is just simply the number that occurs most frequently. So that's the measure of central tendency. But as we've seen in our little experiment, or in, in the example uh, on uh, Monday, there can be quite a bit, of, a bit of a spread between the data points. So we had somebody who was one, uh, 190 centimeters and uh, one person who was 154 centimeters. Uh, so that uh, shows you that there is quite a wide spread. And very often we are quite interested in this spread. How spread out are our samples? And there is a very nice tool to visualize that. And this tool is called a box and whisker plot. I explained that to my son, uh, how this works. And the cat was sitting next to him, and all of a sudden, the cat got terribly excited because it thought that I said whiskers plot as the cat food. Uh, so he got uh, terribly agitated. Now it's a box and whisker plot. What does, what does a box and whisker plot look like? Okay. I've got a few data points here, and because I'm a nice person, I've already ordered them. Yes, that's better. So we have 21, 23, 24, 25, 29, 33. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, six data points. This, for example, could be the, the weight, the adult weight of a house mouse. So I catch six, my, six, six mises and weigh them, put them on the balances, on the scales, and measure them how much do they weigh. That's all in grams, for example. Now, can you please be so good and calculate for me the average? What is the average weight of a house mouse, please? I haven't done that myself.
Do we know what, a, what the average weight of a house mouse is? 25? 25.6. 25.8. Okay. So the average weight, and I uh, notate that with this X bar, is 25.8 grams. Do we agree? Yes. Yep, fantastic. It's quite a fat one, actually. Now, can you please, from this data set, can you please calculate or give me the median? What would be the median? Twenty four point five, that is the median. So median is twenty four point five. Now a very easy way to deal with that is basically you just from each end you just write things off until you get into the middle. So twenty one and thirty three, twenty three and twenty nine. So we've got twenty four and twenty five here. And because we have not a single number here, we just simply take the average. So 24 plus 25 divided by 2 gives us 24.5. That's the median. Okay, so we got the median. Actually, you see the median and the mean are slightly different. But it's not a problem. It's not a requirement that they're both the same. They can be hugely different. OK, so we've got the median. What we know is from this median, and that's more or less the definition of the median, is that 50% of our data are below the median. And 50% are above the median. That is why we sometimes call the median, in this case, the 50th percentile. Nothing terribly exciting, it's just a few definitions. Okay, we can do something else now. We are left with three data points with these ones here that are below the median. And of course, what we could do with them is we could try and find the median of these three data points again. So we find the median of, well, the 50% that are smaller than the median. You get what I mean, yeah? So what would be the median here? Loud? 23. So here, we have this one here, 23. So we have 23, we have 24.5, and because it was so much fun, of course we can do the median of the data that are above the median. What would that be? 29. OK? So we have three data points. And we can say here, we call this one here. Let me do it in red. 
we call this one here the first quartile because it divides our data set we divide our data set into four bits so here is the first bit here is the second bit here is if you like the third bit and then, and then we have the rest so this is the first quartile this one here any guess what we call the median here this would be the second quartile and this guy here this would be the third quartile right now what we can do and something pretty simple we can say okay 23 that is our first quartile 24.5 that is our second quartile and 29 that is our third quartile I just simply make some lines and I put there just simply a box around that I drew a nice box and I know that 25% of my data are here and 25% of my data are here okay so that's the box where are the whiskers that gets my cat so excited actually we have some more data points here we have our 21 here this guy here 21 where am I ah yeah here it is our 21 and we've got our 33 here what are we going to do with them well we just put them down we have 21 here and we've got 33 here and all we need to do now is we really connect them to the box and these are if you think about a cat these are the whiskers on each side yeah it's a simple box and whisker plot now there's another there's another definition that we need to learn and that's quite people quite put some emphasis on that this is the range from here from the first quartile to the third quartile how much of our data are in there in this range you just have to look at it it's 25 it's 25 at uh, 25 it's 50 percent of our data are located in this range in the box and this thing is called the I QR which stands for interquartile range so that's the IQR and you will see quite frequently that the IQR gives us a quite a nice feel for how spread out the data are now I give you two box plots that's one box plot
And that's the second box plot. Which one has a, a bigger data spread? Which one has a bigger data spread? The first one has a bigger data spread. So the data are far more spread out. Now, let's do a few more box plots because there are a few tricky bits in them. We just had, oops, we just had 21, 23, 24, 25, 29, and I just add two more, 30 and 33. Okay? Now, tell me, what is the second quartile of that? Other word for second quartile is the 50 percentile or the median. What's the median? 25. You are absolutely right. So we've got 25. That's the median. Now, can you tell me what is the first quartile? 23? Are you happy with that? Yeah, 23, okay. Question for you. Shall we? How did you do that? How did you come to the 23? You took the median of these three numbers. Is that right? Yep, absolutely right. How about, can we do it in a different way? Sorry? Yeah, we could do that. Yep, that's the algorithm for it. That's correct. But can we do something else? Can we include the 25? Shall we include it? Bless you. So shall we do that? Because what you did was you excluded it. Yeah? Can we include it? Shall we exclude or include? Who is for exclude? Hands up. Exclude? You? Include. Hands up. Uh-huh. Who thinks, I don't give a damn, I need caffeine? Hands up. <laughs> yeah, good. At least you are honest. Well, actually, there are no hard and fast rules. You can do both, as long as you are consistent. And that creates a little bit of ambiguity in the whole thing. But you will see that both options are used by people. So what would we get if we include it? What's the first quartile? It would be? It would be 23.5. So 23.5 or it would be 23. What shall we do with the next one? Shall we include or exclude? So if we, if we excluded uh, the first one, the first quartile, then we have to exclude also the third quartile. So what is the third quartile in this case? 30. Okay, fantastic. So we have our box. And we can do our whiskers. And it goes to 33. What is the IQR of that? IQR, the interquartile range, 
is the third quartile minus the first quartile. So it would be seven. And remember, in this IQR, which basically is just a fancy word for the box, in this IQR, you have 50% of our data located. Here are 25, here are 25, and here in the IQR are 50% of the data, and together it gives us 100. Yeah? Right. So far, so good. Here's another one for you guys. 21, 23, 24, 25, 29... Thirty, fifty. How do we deal with that? Median. What's the median? Median is again twenty five. So that's our second quartile. What's the first quartile? Exclude, include, exclude, good. So it would be 23 in this case. And what is our third quartile? 30. Fantastic. So we do our plot again, our box and whisker plot. Which would probably look a little bit like that. So that's the box. That's the interquartile range. What's the interquartile range again? Seven. IQR is seven. So... Let's draw our whiskers. So this one is 21 here. Where's the other one? 50. Uh -huh. So on this plot, it would be over there, wouldn't it? Oh, I, I'm hearing music. Wow. I think I'm going mad. Maybe I've, I've gone long time ago mad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would be over there. Well, it doesn't look right, does it? Have a long whisker. And actually, this 50 that looks really weird. This 50 looks really weird. It almost looks like uh, it doesn't belong to the data. It's almost like what is called an outlier. But can we be sure? And there's actually a sort of a more or less arbitrary definition how we find outliers. For an outlier, an outlier is everything that is more than 1.5 times the IQR away from the Next quartile. <coughs> so
So IQR in this case is 7. 1.5 times 7 is 10.5. Is that right? So 1.5 times IQR is 10.5. So we can put in the range for outliers. And these ranges are called fences. So where would be the fence for an outlier when we look at the 23 here? Where would be the fence? So we would go in this direction. And we would go. 10.5 units away from this 23. What's 23 take away 10.5? 12.5, right? So 12.5, here would be the fence. Everything that is smaller, everything that is smaller, Everything that is smaller than 12.5 could be a, would be an outlier. Yeah? So here would be the outlier region. Where's the outlier fence when we go up? It would be here at 40.5. Everything that is bigger than 40.5 would be an outlier. Does that make sense? So you have the outlier regions. Now we have our 50 here. And we can clearly say this is an outlier our 50. And we usually indicate that with an asterisk. Here's an outlier. And we actually do not do not draw the whisker to outliers. So no whiskers to outliers. Do we have a data that is between the last quartile and the outlier? From our data set, no, we don't. We don't have any data that are between the last quartile and the whisker, and so we, there is no whisker in this case. We can't draw a whisker. What do you suggest? What do you suggest we do with outliers? Cloud. Delete. Good idea? We ignore them. Good idea? What do you think? Shall we delete them? There's a very distinct, no, we shouldn't delete them. Well, from a biological point of view, outliers can be extremely interesting. It could very well be here that, well, 
everything that is sort of in this, in this range here, yeah, that's okay, you know, that's sort of statistical variation. That's, you know, that's fine. Let's sit here. But here, obviously, with this 50, something really strange is going on. Either I'm a complete doofus and I measured the mouse wrong or didn't zero it properly or, you know, something like that. It could be that there's experimental error. And then I hang my head in shame and say, yes, I'm an idiot. I can't even weigh a mouse. Or it could be that this is an extremely fat mouse. Actually, maybe it's not even a mouse. Maybe it's not a house mouse. Maybe it is um, a rat. Well, rats are heavier than that. Maybe it is a, you know, a pregnant mouse. Could very well be. So, usually, if you find outliers, don't just bin them. Look at them. Have I done something wrong here? Or is that something quite interesting? So, watch your outliers. They can tell you quite a lot. Only if you are absolutely sure that you made a complete boo-boo, then ignore them. But otherwise, there could be something in it, and you are lined up for the next Nobel Prize. Because you found something that other people just simply uh, disregarded. So, this is how you can do box plots. Uh, obviously, you will need a little bit more practice with that. There are also um, programs on the internet that allow you to create box plots, which is quite handy. You can also, what you very often will see is that box plots are sometimes drawn like that, as we have done it, or they could also be drawn vertically. In both cases, of course, you would have to have a scale which tells you where the first, second, third quartiles are, where the, uh, where the end whiskers are. Could very well be that you don't have any end whiskers. And then also where the outliers are. Something like that. So you should now know how you can calculate whether a data point is an uh, outlier. And you should know how you draw these um, box and whisker plots. Now, that is sort of quite some nice data visualization. We immediately see where 50% of our data are located. We immediately see the spread of things. But it would be quite nice also to have it in a sort of a mathematical form, these things. So therefore, statisticians have come up with some, what is called, measures of dispersion. Which simply means measures of how far the data are spread out. We can visualize it with a box and whisker plot, but now it would be quite nice to look at these things, how far spread out these data actually are. But before we do that, unfortunately, I have to tell you that life is a bitch. Or as my PhD student uh, once put it, 
life is a bitch and then you marry one. <laughs> I thought that was not particularly nice, but, uh, you know. He also had another phrase, but you are too young to uh, hear that, so, you know, I'm not saying that. What is the problem with life? And statistics. In statistics, statisticians always make the distinction between sample and population. And you can very easily imagine what the problem is. For example, I want to know the height of people in the UK. So that's my entire UK population. It's about, how many have we got? 60 million or so. 60 million people. Of course, I can now walk around and measure everybody. Why would that be, for, uh, why would that be interesting? Well, let's assume I'm a manufacturer uh, for onesies. And I want to make sure that I produce the onesies in the right size. Not too big, not too small, just right. If I produce them too big, yeah, then everybody would fit into it, but I would waste a lot of material. So it would be very good if I had a, had a good idea. And so that's the population. So what I need to take is... I can't measure everybody. So I take just simply a sample from that population. And measure the sample and pray to God that this is a, a reasonable sample that represents well my population. I can take another one, so sample one. I can take another one, sample two. I can take as many samples as, one, as I want, basically. And can say, okay, is that, a, is, is that a good sample? All these things I can do. So we need to make a, dis, a distinction between sample and population. And this this distinction already starts when we say, when we compare these things, sample and population. Statistic data for a sample are called the statistics. Statistic data for a whole population are called parameters. Now, the statisticians have been very nice to us because sample statistics, population parameter, uh, at least we, they start with the same letter. So when I talk about the statistics, you know that I actually refer to a sample. When I talk about a parameter, then you know that I refer to a population. Now, let's talk about the means. Of course, I can calculate the mean of a sample. And if my population isn't too big, then I can also calculate the mean of the population. And to indicate that we are talking about the mean of a sample, we call it x bar for the 
sample. And we call it mu, Greek letter mu, when we talk about a population. Now, what I'm going to do when I produce my onesies, when I manufacture my onesies, I say, okay, I take the mean of the sample because this helps me to have an educated guess about the population mean. So with this, I can sort of almost guess, make an inference from the sample mean what the parameter mean should be. Does that make sense so far? Very often, we will be able to calculate the sample mean, the x bar, and from there then say, right, my sample of men, or of, no, of people in general, was average 1 meter and 80. So I believe that the average population in the UK is also 1 meter 80. But there is a certain, there is a, there's an uncertainty in it. And I need to be aware of that. And this uncertainty comes because my sample doesn't include my entire population. So we need to be aware of that. Now, last, last but not least, I want you to um, give you a practical example of the misuse of statistics, or rather, statistics sort of, maybe not statistics. During World War II, Stalin 